as I climbed in the car. I found I was still in shock. Twenty years of my life given to the company, only to have it all come crashing down in a single afternoon because they felt my position had become redundant. They called me down to HR, offered me a severance and a thank you, and escorted me out. It all felt so surreal. Leaving the parking lot, I wondered what I would do next. I could probably find another job rather fast, but did I really want to? I had given up so many nights and weekends, lost the love of my life, and missed out on so much because of work. Maybe now was the time to live a little. I pondered my next move the entire drive home, thinking about all the possibilities. As I pulled into my driveway, one thought started working on me more than any other. When I was a kid, we used to go camping every summer in a national park. We usually tried to visit a new park each year, and I got to see most of them before I went off to college. We would hike the trails, sleep under the stars, and sing campfire songs as we roasted marshmallows. It was a feeling I missed more than anything, especially since work had kept me from the last camping trip before my dad died. Before I did anything else that evening, I started planning a trip in my head. I would need to buy most of the gear new, and I would need to find the perfect spot for a solo excursion. This was going to be my chance to reconnect with myself and decide what the next stage of my life would bring, so it had to be perfect. The next week was filled with online searching and visits to different stores to pick up gear. I found an easy to assemble tent that was just the right size, some super comfortable hiking boots, and a pack that would fit everything without weighing me down too much. As for location, I finally decided on the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. We had been there once when I was a teen, and there were a couple of trails that I wanted to revisit. It was early June, so the weather wouldn't be too much of an issue, and I set aside a couple of weeks to give myself plenty of time to sightsee and meander. Packing up the car, I set out early on a Monday morning, taking my time and stopping along the way to check out some of the more touristy spots on the drive. I spent that night in a hotel before finishing the journey on Tuesday morning. After a quick lunch, I set out for my first hike early in the afternoon in what turned out to be the perfect weather. The excitement of finally getting out and doing something for myself made the whole thing even better. Looking back, I should have known it wouldn't last. Tuesday night was the first night of camping. The tent was a little harder to set up than I expected, and a brief but heavy rainfall prevented me from starting a fire to cook on. Ready to just get the day over with, I curled up in my sleeping bag and drifted off to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of scratching outside the tent. Assuming it was a bear, I remained as still as I could and hoped it would give up when it couldn't reach the food tied high up in the tree. I felt it rub against the back of the tent at one point, and I could hear it breathing inches away. After what felt like an hour, it wandered off back to wherever it came from. The early sunrise on Wednesday wasn't as welcome as I had hoped it would be. I barely slept after the late night disturbance, and I was on the verge of ending the trip early. A nice cup of coffee and some powdered eggs over a fire helped my mood, and I decided to push on. I packed up camp and got back on the trail, ready to explore and see where the day would take me. Taking my time and only covering a couple of miles per hour, I soaked in all the sights and sounds the forest had to offer. I couldn't help but think that the first night was nothing more than a fluke, as the morning gave way to another beautiful afternoon. I spent the evening at an overlook, where I could see the sun setting through the trees as I set up camp. A nice warm dinner over a crackling fire was just what I needed to really strike the mood. This was what I had come out here for. The sound of crickets chirping and birds singing their last songs of the day helped me relax. And before long, I was settling in for night two in the tent. I was just drifting off to sleep when I heard what had to be the same bear from the night before rummaging through my sight yet again. This time, I heard a tree branch snap as it tried to get at the food I had tied beyond its reach. 
It started growling and pacing around my tent as if trying to convince me to come out and get the food down. After an hour of pacing, it finally grunted and moved back off into the forest. I listened for it, thinking it might come back, but I was soon fast asleep. Thursday was a lot like Wednesday, except I was now thinking that the best course of action might be to leave the park and let a ranger know about the bear. It seemed to be getting more aggressive each night, and I was actually worried it might do more than just pace around the tent if I stayed out there. This thought was pushed to the back of my mind when I met a couple who had been out there since the prior week. They told me they had a similar experience the first couple of nights they were out, but the animal stopped bothering them when it realized it wasn't getting the food. With this reassurance, I decided to try one more night and see what happened. Hiking a few more miles, I set up camp near a small river where I thought that in the worst case, I would be safe from one side. As I ate dinner, the peace of the forest around me helped to keep my mind settled, but I couldn't help but think about how the previous night had started out as peaceful too. I tied my food up in a tree, tossing the rope over a branch that hung out over the river to add more deterrence for anything that wanted to try and get at it. With camp secure, I climbed into my tent and started to relax. The sounds of the night helped me drift off to sleep quicker than I expected, and I dreamed I was back home in my cozy bed. The light from the early morning sun on my tent woke me. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I started to feel some excitement as I realized the animal that had been visiting me had finally moved on. As I climbed out of my sleeping bag, I couldn't wait to get some breakfast and hit the trail again, but breakfast would have to wait. Unzipping my tent, I climbed out and realized right away that something was off. My bag of food was no longer hanging where I had left it, with the bag itself laying empty and neatly folded next to the fire ring. The food was nowhere to be seen. As I looked around, I found footprints in the mud next to the river. They weren't like any animal I had ever seen, almost like a cross between a bear and a human, with five distinct fingers and claw impressions that went out as far as the actual fingers. Placing my average-sized hand next to one of the prints, I found the print was much bigger. Then I realized there was more than one set of prints. The set I had been focusing on was the smaller of the two, but there was definitely more than one animal. Not only that, the tracks seemed to originate from the river, meaning whatever made them had come out of the water. I knew at that point that I had to get out of the forest as soon as possible. Packing up my remaining gear, I looked at the map and discovered I could cut through the forest and get back to the parking lot by lunch. Quietly thanking my dad for the wilderness survival knowledge he had crammed into me as a kid, I set off through the trees. I had only been hiking for about an hour when I realized that the sun had faded behind clouds. That by itself wouldn't have been too big of a deal, but the sound of distant thunder told me things were about to get rough. I wasn't ready for the rain, but it arrived within a few minutes, coming down in buckets. Knowing I couldn't keep going without getting lost, I was about to just sit down and wait it out when I saw a cabin about 30 feet ahead. Pushing through, I made it to the porch, finding the place to be abandoned. Assuming it was some off-season hunting cabin, I tried the door and found it was unlocked. I got inside and set my bag down, hoping the rain would pass soon and I could get out of there. As I took stock of the situation, I realized there was something on the far wall. It looked like newspaper clippings, though I wasn't sure until I got closer. Reading over the headlines, I noticed they were all about missing hikers. Some were from the previous few years, but there were others that dated back almost a century. Most were solo hikers, though there were a couple of duos and even one or two small groups. I thought for a second someone might be tracking some kind of conspiracy. Then I saw a handwritten note off to the side. Let's see if we can do better this year. Signed with a heart. I think the full realization of what I was looking at was lost on me at first, at least until I saw the picture hanging above the fireplace. The couple I had met just the day before was standing in the middle of the frame, the mountains behind them covered in snow. Something about the picture felt very wrong. 
Making my way to the door, I heard voices outside and decided to grab my bag and duck inside a closet just as someone entered the cabin. A crack between the door and the frame allowed me to get a glimpse of the man and woman as they walked through the room. I don't know where he went, I lost the scent in the rain, the man said. The first one of the year and you botched it, the woman replied. Just give me a few minutes to relax and we can get back out there. Even if we can't find him today, he can't hide from us tonight. The man was now sitting in a chair in the corner. There was nothing but silence for the next few minutes as the woman paced around the room, waiting on her partner to get back up. Once or twice, I thought she was going to open the closet door, but she must have just been fidgety. I was starting to feel claustrophobic when the man stood back up and headed for the door. He must have been waiting for the rain to let up. Even after I was sure they had both left, I waited in the closet for another half hour before slowly creeping out. I could see the sun had started shining again, coming through the windows of the cabin. Hoping they had left the area, I made my way back outside and started moving as fast as I could through the forest. I felt like I was being chased the whole way back to the parking lot, but I didn't stop or turn around to find out. The sight of my car made me jump for joy and I hurried to get inside. More than ready to get home, I put the key in the ignition and turned, only to find that it wouldn't start. So, that's how I got here, sitting in my car, afraid to get out and check under the hood and waiting for night to fall. This trailhead isn't the most popular, and I'm afraid no one else will get here in time to help. My only hope is that someone will find this note and stop these psychopaths before anyone else gets hurt. I don't know what they are, but I can feel them watching me even as I write this.